On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumna, Chief Leslie Wadeye, to address convocation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, very humbled to be here standing before you um, to, uh, receiving this great honor. It is quite a humbling experience. I am um, a proud Anishinaabe Ojibwe Kwe, which means I am an indigenous woman, but also I am Ogamakwe which means I've been recently elected as the chief at Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. For many of you who may not know, our community has been downriver the Thames River for many hundreds of years. And we're, we're very proud uh, people that belong to a place, uh, a council called the Three Fires Confederacy. We're made up of Odawa people, Botawatomi people, and Ojibwe people. We're proud people. And we're very, 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 very proud of our history here on this place called Deshkan Zibing, which is what we call Thames River. I, um, <clears throat> when thinking about this work that you've done as graduates, I'm thinking about you also as emerging leaders. When I first took this role not too long ago, two years ago, I thought to myself, how is it that I'm going to call up on the experiences of my past to bring what is best forward on what I can bring to our community in support of the work that was already going on? I would suspect that you're asking the same of yourselves. You come from a long tradition at King's College, where at the very central base of what, you, what, what you're learning, you you come from a basis with which to wear a lens of social justice. Those of you that, um, that know about the work uh, post-Truth and Reconciliation Commission and post-United uh, Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, there's a lot, lot of work ahead of us. You, uh, as you know, as a leader in a First Nation community, I wear many hats, one of the most important being the protection of treaty rights and the protection of Aboriginal rights and the protection of a, of a place called Deshkan Zibi that belongs to a larger uh, Anishinaabek nation. In that role, I have to draw upon many skills. And sometimes I don't always feel that I have them. And so then I call upon my friends and my loved ones, and I think about how it is that they might be stood up to help in this good work. So when I think about emerging leadership, I think about how is it that we're going to raise leaders for the future that are gonna call up upon each other to help one another in the work that's ahead of us. I think gone are the days where we stand up and think we need to do this ourselves. I think gone are the days where we think that we have to have all the answers and that we can sh not show any humility in the work that we're doing. Whatever it is, whatever that vision you have as a graduate, whatever it is your vision, that vision will fulfill itself every single time that you talk to somebody, every single time that you put out your dream. One little piece of it will be picked up by someone else. Someone is going to help you. And the reason I can say that is because I've lived it. You're not in this alone. The work ahead of you, the vision that you have for yourself, and the vision you have for your family and your communities can only transpire because you've talked out loud about it, because you've told people about it, because you've, you've believed in it so, with so much hunger that people want to help you because there's a call to action. There's a... Um, beautiful man by the name of Onabinase. He's uh, Three Fires Confederacy, or sorry, he's the Three Fires Medewin Eastern Doorway Chief. 
and he talks about a time in the early 70s in the southwest region, this region here of the Great Lakes, where it was a vision of one man, a young man, to call upon and find out about fasting. This is in the early 1970s. And in that one call out, and in that one inaction, to find out about something he knew of himself and his identity as an Anishinaabek Nine, what had happened as a result of that one call out is another friend of his wanted the same. And then another friend of his wanted the same. And what happened is the elders came and they've started to fulfill that vision for that young man. This happened in Michigan in the early 1970s, not too long after a time when we were denied of the ability to publicly celebrate our ceremonies. Onabinase, in the sharing of this, he wanted to help us understand the significance of enacting a vision. It's one thing to say it out loud and keep saying it, but it's the next thing of actually taking the next step to enact it. And that's what that young man did. Back in the early 1970s, in our history as Aboriginal peoples in this place called Canada, there was a lot of turmoil going on at the time. The white paper had been released, and there was a lot of dissension. And there was a lot of wanting to do different. The vision of Canada at the time was not the same as the vision of indigenous peoples of this land. In the early 1970s, they were in direct opposition of each other. How is it that we, we were going to face that type of plan for Canada that didn't include us? And so when I think about that, people will want to say, well, your immediate reaction is you should stand up and rally and take and go work with the governments and figure out a way to do this work. But this young man decided that's not what he needed. He needed to enact a vision that would tell him who he was so he always spoke from that place, and that was through fasting. He, in that inaction, in that going after, what had happened is one fast, or two, three fasters turned into a gathering. And out of that gathering came ceremony. And out of that ceremony came the telling of prophecies. And out of that prophecies came the request and asked for more. All of out of that one enactment of vision. You are in a different time. You, and I believe this strongly, are going to be our emerging leaders that will also draw from a different vision of Canada. I believe strongly that a vision of Canada can be realized where we're no longer, as Aboriginal Indigenous peoples of this land, wondering in, if we're on the, going to be on a parallel path where we can both walk a similar road and find the success with which, under our own terms, and what that could look like. I feel you, in this generation, in this generation coming forward, are going to be able to do that. I strongly believe that. You're in a different time. You have at your disposal technology. You have at your disposal the ability for one enactment to tweet an idea that I will see even though I don't know you. You have at your ability one Facebook message that could tell the world exactly how you feel about your vision of Canada. You've been given a platform to tell and share your voice as young people in Canada, just as we have. We've not had that type of voice before as Indigenous peoples. We've not been able to rally around a common co communication tool as we have been able to now. I feel we're kindred in our spirit. I feel that the youth of this generation have at your disposal, as we do, the ability to tell a vision, compel change, and move something forward in an incredibly, way, incredibly powerful way than any other generation before us. I'm going to look to you to help us in that endeavor. And help us because what it does is it brings us closer together. Help us 
because what it does as indigenous peoples, as young people who are emerging and becoming our future leaders, your very voice, your very actions, your very enacting of a vision could very well bring all of the work in the centuries of unfortunate de colonization to a close if we can figure this out together. So when I was asked about how it is that um, I could lend a voice this today, I'm a new chief. I feel strongly that the only way we're going to do this is because we can build bridges. We can extend our hand. We can invite a conversation. You're in your scholarly uh, intentions and all of the good work and all of the family that were behind you in doing this. You were built to have discussion. You were built to dialogue. You are built to embrace a different kind of reality that allows for an openness like never before. And I don't mean just with my culture and my history and what I believe a vision of Canada could look like. You have the ability to connect with all of that across the world. And that's powerful. Will you take up the cause? Will you take up the cause? Will you project far into a future a vision of Canada that brings people together? That's what I'm asking. That's what we are needing here in this post-Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission era. And I don't doubt that you will. I don't doubt that you're going to come orientated to think about how it is that cultures, different belief systems, different ways of organizing societies, different ways of thinking about success are going to be led by you. And it's necessary. We at Chippewas of the Thames are very proud of who we are as a people. Our very ancient truths are coming to realization. We believe and have carried those bundles for a very long time while they remained hidden, and some had put them away, and some had forgotten them. Others are picking, picking them up. And when I talk about those ancient truths, I'm talking about that belief for spirit, that everything we do is filled with spirit. Now, I know at King's College, there is a want to build and fill, fulfill a life of spirit. We believe the same thing as Anishinaabek people. Our very life centers around an understanding of spirit, of a life force, a forever life. Right at the very core, what's placed within every one of us, a forever life. It's never dimmed. Never dimmed. The only thing that dims it is the, the shells we place over top of it. But your intention, your vision, your enacting of a vision, your want to include others will ensure that those layers don't cover up that bright light that shines inside of you, as our teachings tell us. I know for sure that if it's, we fulfill a vision of Canada where the spirit is fed, where our mind is fed, where our physical body is fed, we're going to find all of what we need to live a fulfilling life, just as our creation story tells us, a red road. And I believe strongly that in this time, in this place, in 2017 and going forward, there has never been a more important call to action, a never been a more important call to attend to the very sustenance of life, the very things that feed us, the very things that provide for us, and that is water. You have before you a very complex, what we would call wicked problem. And I'm sorry to say that we've left it there for you to pick up, but I'm here to help and work with you on that, just as many other elders and leaders of indigenous peoples across the world are, are asking for that, that work to be done. The complexity of the problems facing us, I think, can be, can be harnessed and addressed by the very 
amount of commitment and determination that sits right in this room right now. I don't think that my vision of Canada is too far off from many. I think if we sat down at the table long enough that my vision of Canada and our vision of Canada as Anishinaabek people is not too far off from yours. At the very center of spirit life is family life. At the very center of family life is community life. And at the very center of community life is a balance of roles and responsibilities of rights and commitments and the willingness to do the hard work to ensure that seven generations from now we have not left them a place that no, cannot flourish and not, cannot feed that spirit. This new chapter in your life, this new enactment, think of it. Harness this moment. Look around you. Look beside you. Look in front of you. Those are your leaders. Those are your partners. Those are the people that are going to come together as you did already all of these years in your, in your time here at King's College to do better, to want to succeed and want to motivate to succeed. I hope that that motivation is one of community. It's one of making better, of giving back. There are four things that were given to us according to our creation story. First one was free will. Can Canada understands that. Canada understands under a democratic society what free will looks like for themselves. I'm asking for many of you who will become future legislators, who will become future Congress, maybe senators and, and m members of parliament, or even just uh, community drivers and community leaders. That that vision of Canada where there was free will didn't always apply to us. And so I'm going to ask in your leadership, no matter where you land, a construction site, a restaurant, a nonprofit organization, that you think about that. How is it that in Canada there were not those rights and freedoms for everyone? And how is it that we can work together to undo all of that? The second gift was language. Our language is sacred, and within that tells the story of spirit. Our third gift were clans. It tells us the importance of family. It tells us how very central to everything that builds community is understanding who we are as a family. I've been told that if in the past, Three, four hundred years ago, I would not have looked out here looking for your name. I would have looked out here looking for you as your clan. Instead of seeing, you know, a thousand people here, I would have probably said, there's 10 or 15 clans here, and we're all family. And we identified each other as clans first. That put us in a place of relations. It put us in a place of relationships. And I think that the very future depends on this work. And I think that the very future depends in your jobs, in your future leadership roles, that you harness and you work towards how it is that you're going to build those relationships that truly understand where those relations come from and the context with which they, are, they began. And finally, the fourth gift given to us by creation before we uh, were lowered into, onto this uh, place called Turtle Island, we were given our name. We were told how very special we were. When you are given your name, all of creation stops and listens. How powerful is that? How powerful is it that when in your creation story, you're told that you're so special, that there's a pause in all of creation to acknowledge your presence. That's a story. Seven generations from now, 
that has to survive. That's a story that you're going to need to carry forward with your family and your loved ones and when you have children that they might know that feeling that everything around them stops because of how you named them and how they became of you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm happy to be acknowledged and humbled to know that we live not too far from here and that a relationship is being developed. These institutions are important just as our institutions are important. And I can't wait for the time when we are building and understanding each other's institutions, our places of gathering, our understanding of lodge, and our understanding of health, and how it is that we take care of one another, and how it is we feed spirit, and how it is that when we develop our understanding of strength, it comes from a place of love. I think many of the ills ahead of us can be solved in that one inaction, reaching out and building communities where people feel loved. I think a lot of work ahead of us is going to de depend on that. Our health care system is not going to be able to sustain the, the approach we're taking now to Medicaid. We demand the return of ceremony, the demand the return of protocol, demand the return of gathering, gathering as peoples in celebration. I'm so happy to be here. Congratulations to all of you. What will your vision be? How will you enact it? And who are you going to bring along for the ride? You're not in this alone. There are so many that want to support you. And our future depends on it that you'll act with integrity, humility, and with the most important thing, a place of spirit and love in your work. Miigwech for this honor. Miigwech for your attention. Congratulations to all of you. And I look forward to the relationship building that we'll be undertaking, because our paths will cross. And if it isn't me, it's going to be those treaty partners that you're going to find yourself in all across Canada and they're going to be there waiting for you, waiting for that call, asking for that relationship to begin and to be fostered. Miigwech and thank you.